BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to the prophet Yirmiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 26. The prophet Yirmiyahu, chapter 26. This is message P250. P250. This is entitled, Amend Your Ways. Amend Your Ways. I'm going to give you a synopsis of the message, and then we're going to dive right into it to try to get it in in one hour's worth of time. And if you miss any of this message, it will be recorded so you can pick it up online and the rest of the message in our Shabbat uh, message of this incredible word the Lord gave me today. Synopsis. Most people think of God, think of the God of the Old Testament as a God of anger and rules. What most people fail to see is a king that is full of forgiveness and mercy. All this king asks for is something very simple if you love him. What he asked for is that each person amend, amend their own heart. Now this might be something too difficult for those who only call on Jehovah when they want something. For those who truly desire the riches of heaven. For those who want his face to shine on you. For those who want his incredible shalom to be with you. For those who are feeling a little nervous about the events going on in the world. Take the next little while to learn about what it means to amend your heart. Amen? Let us dive into the scriptures. Let us go to Yirmiyahu Jeremiah chapter 26. Yirmiyahu Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 11 through 13. We're going to start off small and build up a little bit. Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu chapter 26, verse 11 through 13. I'll say it one more time. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 11 through 13. The Kohanim and prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man deserves death, deserves a death sentence, because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Yirmiyahu said to the officials and all the people, Jehovah sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words you have heard. Therefore, now improve your ways and your doings and listen to the voice of Jehovah. Your Elohim, then Jehovah will relent from the disaster he has decreed against you. Amen? All right, let us uh, look back at verse 12. Verse 12. Then Yirmiyahu said to the officials and all the peoples, Jehovah sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words you have heard. Amen? Okay, that's mainly what our jobs are today. Uh, the, the rabbis, the pastors that follow the Shabbat, okay, um, is to call people to come back to his ways, to send uh, what, what we are doing when we're calling people to repent, okay, what we are doing is offering terms for peace. The Lord, before he sends on destruction, what he does is he sends people like myself and those others that are strong on the word of God and don't really worry about your feelings, but worry more about your souls. The Lord sends strong followers of his word and his ways to offer people terms of peace. And that's what Jeremiah was being sent. 
before they were taken off to Babylon, he was sent to prophesy against the house of Israel and against the city that was not following the ways of God. So, because the way the Torah works is that before you, the Lord brings on chastisement, before you make war on the city, it says, you must offer terms for peace. That's found in Devarim. Okay? You must offer terms for peace. Now, here is the most be- one of the most beautiful sentences in all the Bible. Because a lot of people, next in verse 13, people think of the God of the Old Testament as this mean old ogre of a God. Always chastising people. Always, you know, wanting everybody to follow rules and you know he's no fun he's you know the no fun league and and things like that but look at verse 13 it really is quite a beautiful verse because he wants everybody to be in heaven he doesn't want anybody to perish but he wants everybody to be there verse 13 therefore now improve your ways and your doings and listen to the voice of Jehovah your Elohim then Jehovah will relent from the disaster he has decreed against you. Amen? The word improve in the CJB is what the word is amend in most other translations. The Hebrew word is yat. You know, sorry, yatab. Sorry, yotav bet. Yot, yatab. Okay? It means to be good, pleasing, be well, be glad. Let me say that again, the definitions of yatab. To be good, be pleasing, be well, be glad. So the Lord is saying through his prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, he's saying, amend your ways and your doings so that I don't have to chastise you because I have this disaster decreed for you, but he's offering mercy and grace. See, this is the God of the Old Testament, the God who is jealous. He he calls himself jealous. But what he does also say through his prophets and through through the Torah, he says, you know, if if you turn around, if you amend your ways, if you change what you're doing, if you listen to the voice of Jehovah, your Elohim, then he's going to relent. So first, let's look at the word improve. If we improve our ways... Okay. Now, many people don't know what that means because they don't know the Torah of God. But the Torah of God lives inside of us. Okay. Now, there are, are some teachers like this ministry and uh, Beth Yeshua over there and other, you know, there's a few ministries teaching the solid word of God and teaching people how to improve their relationship with Jehovah. That's what Shabbat is about. When you set everything down, you stop the phone, you stop the television, you stop the, 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 the surfing the internet, you stop YouTube, you stop Facebook, and you listen intently, you shema, okay, you shema, you listen intently to improve your ways. Improve your ways how? Improve your ways of following the commandments of God. The ways of doing things, okay, the ways that He wants things done, not the way I want things done, not the way Pastor Oni wants things done, not the way the president or the prime minister, or whatever country you want thing, they want things done, but to the king of all creation, the ruler of all the earth and the universe. He's wanting us to improve our ways. Then Jehovah will, he says, show you mercy and grace. He will show you mercy because he had every right to destroy you because you were breaking his commandments. And then he said, if you, you follow his way, the creed that he is going to destroy you, he will relent from it. He will bless you. Okay? So, okay? He wants you to follow his ways. Okay? He had decreed disaster. Okay? So, he wants you to change your ways. Now, why is that important to understand? See, before you read the, the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, you must understand the, the character, the, the, how God works, okay? And why he brings on certain parts of his law, why he tells you to follow his ways, what he wants from you. Now, with that part, now let's read verse 13 again. Therefore, now improve your ways. 
or amend your ways and your doings and listen to the voice of Jehovah your Elohim, then Jehovah will relent from the disaster he has decreed against you. Okay, it's a very important understanding that if we change our ways, the disaster which he has said he's going to do, so it doesn't make him a liar, he says, okay, you change, I don't gotta spank you harder, I don't gotta do these things, because he's not lying, because although he knows the end from the beginning, he knows everything, he knows if you're going to, he has to offer terms for peace. Before he wakes war on you, or war on the city, okay, he has to offer terms for peace, that is the law. And he's not going to break the law. So, he's, so Jeremiah is saying to the leadership there, and remember, Scripture is never ends. Okay, That's what a lot of people forget. That you know, just because Jeremiah said it to the house of Israel, and he said it to the leadership there, it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us today. That's what we forget. That Scripture is alive, it's breathing, it's never stopping. The book of Acts never ended. So that means Scripture doesn't end. Shabbat doesn't end. Pesach doesn't end. Okay? It has its place and it has its time. So now, if we see, like we saw once again today on Shabbat, okay, there was another Muslim terrorist attack in Germany. Okay? Every single week we're having something, more than one of these events happening. And the thing is, why is it happening? Why is it happening? Well, let's turn to 1 Kepha chapter 4. 1 Kepha, 1 Peter chapter 4. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to read one verse. You might want to take out your wonderful Bible and find it. 1 Peter, 1 Kepha, Kepha Aleph, chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Kepha, Kepha Aleph, chapter 4, verse 17. This part is called, There is Judgment in the New Testament. I know a lot of people tell me, you know, in the New Testament it's all about grace and mercy. Well, let's see what the Talmud, the disciple Kepha, had to say about that theology. First Kepha chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for the judgment to begin. It begins with the house of God. And if it starts with us, what will the outcome be for those who, who are disobeying, disobeying God's good news. Let's read that again. It's very important. You might want to underline it if you have not already. For the time has come for the judgment to begin. It begins with the household of God. And if it starts with us, that what will the outcome be for those who are disobeying God's good news? Amen? I thought the Christians tell me that God in the New Testament, he's all about grace and mercy and love. Evidently, they haven't read what Peter wrote. That God brings on judgment, and judgment, when it starts, and as we're seeing in the Brit, in the Brit Hadashah, it starts with the house of God. And what has been happening throughout the Middle East? What is now happening a lot of places around the globe? Chastisement of God's people. In the Middle East, Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Christians have been murdered. By who? The Buddhists? No. By the Sikhs? No. By the Jews? No. By the Muslims. And then all you have to do is understand Deuteronomy 28, verse 49 to 50. But what we are looking at today is us, the body. This message is for us, the body. Because if Kepha is saying judgment is going to begin with us, we, in the body, those that are celebrating Shabbat, if you're really not doing Shabbat, you're just doing your time, then when things really begin to escalate, do not think that you can change your ways then. You have to ride out the chastisement. The object of this particular teaching is this, to learn how to amend our hearts before the time of judgment comes. Now, what, what is really interesting about this passage is that Kepha, remember, Israel got kicked out of the land in 70. Now, Yeshua lived 
And he did his ministry up until about approximately the age 33 and a half. So between 33 and 70 is not many years. It's 37 years. And here already, Kepha is telling the Messianic congregation, the church, that judgment is going to begin with the house of God. And it starts with us. Because we are not following in spirit and in truth. We have to learn how to amend our hearts. It is not good enough to say, Kepha said it's not good enough here to just say, I believe in Messiah Yeshua. If you, Satan believes in Messiah Yeshua, he doesn't want to follow him. Our job is to follow his example. For we need to amend our ways. Now, the reason that judgment is happening, let's take a look at how education works. The Lord spoke the word in the garden. He spoke it to Adam and Chava. And we saw how that turned out. Okay? Then he told Adam and Chava the commandments. Or actually he told the commandment, the single commandment, the first kosher law ever given was do not eat something. Okay? It was a kosher law. Okay? Then he... We, we go through time, Israel goes into uh, bondage in Egypt, then Jehovah leads us by the hand out of that, and then he speaks the commandments once again to a mixed multitude on the mountain. He spe speaks it, all the commandments, you know, he speaks specifically the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 to a mixed multitude, meaning Jew and Gentile. Then after that, he gives us the written Torah, so there will be no misunderstandings of what one person's heart believes and another person's heart believes. It is written down. It is very simplistic. It is not like, you know, crazy writings, and, you know, where it's imagery and stuff like that. It says, don't eat this. Do eat this. Do this on this day. Do this holy day on this day. Very simple, not very hard. Okay? Then the Lord gave us the Tanakh, the Old Testament to show the errors that came before us. Okay? How these people messed up. How these people uh, did good. Okay? The positive and the negative. Then Messiah Yeshua came and he gave us his own personal example. Okay? He showed you and he told you how to be holy. Then what he did after that is he sent the Ruach HaKodesh to see, he told you, I'm going to send the Ruach HaKodesh, the counselor, not the comforter, the counselor, the lawyer, to remind you of the loss. And he says he's going to remind you of everything that I said. And what did Yeshua say? Follow my father's rules. Okay? Then he gave you, then these men also gave you their own testimony. Now, with that in mind, go back to verse 17. Now, with that, all that in mind, the history, in a nutshell, of the scriptures... Now we go back to verse 17. For the time has come for the judgment to begin. It begins with the household of God. And if it starts with us, what will the outcome be for those who are disobeying God's good news? Amen? Okay, now if you guys don't want to amend your ways, then the judgment's going to begin. But it's not only going to be for us. You know, we have a lot of family members, a lot of people that we knew, a lot of people that you know, we, we grew up with you know, cousins and things like that, that may not be following in spirit and in truth. We may have a lot of friends and family members that may not even be believing at all. They might be secular pagans, okay? So when we fail, when the body fails, then we get chastised, and then they get chastised even worse, okay? What will the outcome be, Kepha says, for those who are disobeying God's good news? It's going to be even worse for them. Now, do you want that for them? Do you want that for us? Do you want that for children that may be you know, not following, or you know, a prodigal son that has gone away, a prodigal daughter that has gone away, a, a mother, a father, brother, sister? You know, do you really want that? So we, God's people, God's house, those that are following in you know, the Torah, we have such a great honor that Kepha is telling us. For the time has come for judgment to begin. And why is it beginning? Why is it doing it now? See, it was doing it then, and in 70, it totally destroyed everything. There was just a remnant left. 
Israel you know, got kicked out, destroyed, sent to the four corners of the earth because we had angered God so much that he said the judgment to begin. Now, if we're looking around the globe, why is this happening? It starts with the judgment of the God's house. Okay? So 37 years after Messiah's death and resurrection, now we get kicked out. Now we get kicked out for how long? We get kicked out for how long? Would you like a mathematical equation? Okay, would you like a mathematical equation? Okay, get the phone out real quick. Okay, we got kicked out in 70, and we didn't come back to becoming a nation until 1948. So how many years did we get kicked out for? How many years did we get kicked out? We got kicked out in 70, and then we finally, became, we finally came back as a nation in 1948. How, ma how many years is that? How many years is that, calculus boy? Do, 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 1878 years. 1878 years. Almost there, she says. 1878 years. So when God starts judgment, that's a long time, and many generations to be out of the house. And all the key was God was offering. In Jeremiah, he says, I'm offering you the opportunity to stay here. I'm offering you grace and mercy, and all you got to do is amend your way of doing things. That's the God of mercy. That's the God I love. That's the God I serve. The God of awesomeness. You know, I got a phone call in the middle of the day today. You know, I guess it was somewhere around 2 in the afternoon from the building that we, 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 we have down here. And what's so interesting, the, the lady goes, uh, there's a water main break in the, in, the, in the city, and there's no water. I'm like, all right, whatever. We're still going to meet for Shabbat. So I come into the building. I'm like, okay, Lord, it's your building. And lo and behold, the water is operational again because it's God Shabbat. That's the God I serve. I didn't worry about it. I'm like, whatever. We got drinking water. You know, we got bottles of water, bottles and bottles and bottles of water, you know, 50, 60 gallons of water with so many people coming. But that's the God I serve, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God who says, amend your ways, amend your ways, and I will relent. So here, Kef is saying, you know, the judgment's going to start with us, so let's get our act straight, because here he was dealing with a baby messianic congregation, the church, as the people like to call it, the church, okay? And he's telling them, listen, the judgment's going to start with us, because you, you sort of left the world, but you didn't leave the world. We have to choose this day whom you're going to serve. We have to amend our hearts. You're in charge of your heart. So here... That's what we're going to be looking at for the rest of this teaching. Turn to Luke 12 now. Let's take a look at something very fascinating. Luke 12, verse 41 to 48. Luke 12, verse 41 to 48. Luke 12, verse 41 to 48. We're going to look at this. Very interesting. This part is called the servant did not amend his ways. It's called the servant did not amend his ways. Luke 12, verse 41 to 48. Kepha said, Sir, are you telling this parable for our benefit only or for everyone's? The Lord replied, No. Who is the faithful and sensible manager whose master puts him in charge of the household staff to give them their share of food at the proper time? It will go well with that servant if he is found doing his job when his master comes. Yes, I tell you that he will put him in charge of all, his, all he owns. But if that servant says to himself, my master is taking his time coming, and starts bullying the men and women servants and eating and drinking and getting drunk, then his master will come on a day when the servant isn't expecting him. At a time he doesn't know in advance, his master will cut him in two and put him with the disloyal. Now the servant who knew what his master wanted, but didn't prepare or act accordingly, according to his will, will be whipped with many lashes. However, the one who did what deserved a beating but didn't know will receive few lashes from him who has been given much, 
much will be demanded from someone to whom people entrust much they ask still more amen so what we're going to be looking at in this part of the teaching is about the servant the servant let's go back to verse 41 because this part is called the servant did not amend his ways verse 41 please Kepha said sir are you telling this parable for our benefit only or for everyone's amen see the Bible as I just said before the scriptures the the, the Tanakh and the Brit Hanashah are for then and for now this parable is for then and it also is for now because we serve the same God we serve the same king he never changes so the parable that Yeshua was saying then is also for us okay it's a very profound verse because it is timeless okay the, the word of God is timeless his word as the Lord says his word will never disappear okay for this parable is for then and it is for us today and in this lesson uh, that Yeshua taught it is timeless now let's take a look at why it is timeless let's go now to verse 43 verse 43 it will go well with that servant if he is found doing his job when his master comes okay a amen now what would be the job of a servant okay what is the job of a servant to go make Talmudin of all the Goyim to make students of the word what is a Talmud it is a student of the word to be teaching or to be learning okay whichever is your role okay as you're growing up you're learning and learning and once you get to be 20 you enter into the military of God you can now then start teaching really well to other uh, adults okay because you've learned you now start to spread your wings a little bit you should be doing things for the Lord you should be taking an active role in your congregation especially after you've been there a year you got your feet wet a little bit you should start taking an active role whether or not it's cleaning the congregation setting up the table setting up chairs helping with own egg whatever it is it may be something little but you should be taking an active role as a servant and you should also be learning okay now it says when the master comes he is going to see if you've amended your heart from the world's disgusting things that you were doing okay the master is going to ask you he's going to watch you to see if you've really amended your heart that's the whole objective of this lesson tonight have you amended your heart if Yeshua were to walk in to your house if you, Yeshua were to walk into Beth Yeshua over there, if Yeshua were to walk into Beth Goyim over here, or anywhere in the world, Beth Goyim in Columbia, or any Messianic congregation or church, you know, would he see the people doing their job? Speaking of that, there's a new modern day parable. I thought you might like it. The Lord gave me this new modern day parable. Now, here's a modern day parable for you. And it all ties together with doing your job if the master comes back will he see you be doing your job now here's a modern day parable for you listen up there was a Jewish man who was a true follower of Yeshua he walked with Yeshua night and day for three and a half years he experienced all of his teachings how Yeshua refuted the 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 Pharisees, the Sadducees, when they asked him questions, Yeshua knew the answer right away. And it, that impressed this Jewish man. He was so enamored with Yeshua. He was very impressed and he, he hung on every word that the Master Yeshua would teach. How Yeshua constantly gave glory to the Father. How Yeshua said at Kephas house that one time when, when he was asked, who or my mother and my brothers and Yeshua said that wonderful line where he said my mother and my brothers and sisters are those that do what my father in heaven wants how Yeshua replied and gave always glory to the father in heaven this man remembered how Yeshua did so many miracles on the Sabbath he was just watching Yeshua waiting for the next words to come out of his mouth he would listen intently he would try to get up closer when everybody else was pressing in he would try to come in closer because 
he, you know, he's getting a little bit older, and he had seen things, and he wanted to learn even more so from Messiah Yeshua. And he, and, he, and he really was blessed when Yeshua said he was the Lord of the Sabbath. This Jewish man was even there at the crucifixion. He saw Yeshua hanging on the cross, and he was torn to bits himself, and he, he cried bitterly at the crucifixion. But what stuck in his mind, what stuck in this Jewish man's mind was the cross that Yeshua was on. The cross. He always remembered that cross that Yeshua was placed on by those Gentile Romans. And it was emblazed in his mind. And that man was one of the 500 that saw Yeshua resurrected after the death of him on the cross. And that but that mind, that picture in his mind with Yeshua's arms outstretched and that wood going up and that, that cross. But something happened to that man along the way. He got tangled up in the world. He fell in temptation and then he fell away. But while he was away, something happened to, to him. He fell into a deep Deep, deep sleep for 2,000 years. This man who had walked with Yeshua fell into a deep sleep for 2,000 years. And when he awoke, he still had that picture of Yeshua on the cross in his mind. Now during this sleep, the man, was, before he awoke, the, the man, he said, if I ever wake up from this sleep, Lord, I will repent. I will repent. If I ever wake up from this sleep, I will repent. I will amend my heart. I will amend my ways. I will go back to following the truth. Now, after 2,000 years, this Jewish man wakes up. He wakes up. So the man starts wandering around looking for Yeshua. But he can't find him. Now he's walking down the street. He's, he's walking. And he's looking for Yeshua everywhere. He's looking around. He's like, where is he? Where is he? He's got to be around. I saw him. I saw him rise from the grave. And he walks up and he sees a building. He sees a building. And he sees this big building. And he sees a cross up. And he remembers in his mind. He remembers in his mind. It's like, that looks like the cross that Messiah was on. He remembers the cross. Now it's Shabbat, and he tries to go into the building that has the cross on it, but the doors are locked. So he gets confused. He gets confused. It's Shabbat, right? Shabbat. He keeps walking down the street, and he sees another building with a cross on it. And he goes up to the building, and he goes like, please let these doors be open. Please, I have to find, I have to, I have to amend my heart. I have to speak the words. I have to be in the house of God. And he sees that cross and he knows that's got to be a place that Messiah lives. And he goes up to the door of the second building and it's unlocked. So he walks in expecting to see many, many people. But he only sees a hand, handful of people, but, but they're not worshiping. And it's Shabbat. He asks one of the men, he says, when does the Torah reading begin? So I can hear the word of God. It is the Sabbath, right? The man says, son, I don't know where you've been. You've got a pretty long beard there. He says, son, we, we don't follow the Torah here. Or the, that, we don't need to follow that old book anymore. He, he, he couldn't understand. He couldn't understand. He says, the, 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 that cross, doesn't it represent Yeshua? You know, I remember I was there at the crucifixion. He said, son, who's Yeshua? Are you talking about Jesus? The man says, they don't, know, they don't know the Torah. They don't know Yeshua. And the man says, why, why don't you come on back tomorrow? When the pastor is here, he'll talk to you and set you straight. 
So the man leaves, and he's like, he's walking down the street, and he's, he's very confused, and he's like, it's Shabbat. Why would he tell me to come back tomorrow to talk to the leader? He's like, we don't follow the Torah. It's confusing. We don't follow the Torah here. What book do they follow? We don't know who Yeshua is. Come back tomorrow on the first day of the week. Why would I want to do that? He goes to a third building. He goes to a third building, and he, he stops, and he hears something that sounds like worship music coming out of the building. And he goes up to the sign, and he thinks it says, the seventh day. The seventh day. These people, something, they, the seventh day, he knows that's Shabbat, and he hears music in there. He enters in, and, and there's many people in there singing. He looks all around at the, the men, and he, he doesn't see anyone who appears. And they're not Filipino. He doesn't see, he looks around, and he doesn't see men wearing talits. He looks around again, and he doesn't see men wearing tzitzi. And then he, he waits to hear the word of God. He sits down, and all he keeps hearing is something about this person with the last name of White. He asked somebody there, do you guys read the Torah? Do you follow the holy days? Why don't your men have beards? Why don't you, your men have seat seat on? He leaves the place never to be seen again. He can't find Yeshua anywhere. He can't find his teachings anywhere in his places. He wanted to amend his heart, but there was no one to teach him until he finally stumbled on to a place called Beth Glean, who talks about Yeshua and the Torah. Go back to Luke 12, verse 43. Luke 12, verse 43. It will go well with that servant if he is found doing his job when his master comes, would Yeshua be comfortable if he came into your place? Would he see people wearing a talit? Would he be seeing men wearing tzitzit? Will you be doing your job? The job description. In any of those buildings in the parable, what would happen if the master came back to that building? To those people? Will he find the men doing their job according to the word? Let's look at verse 46. Let's see what Yeshua is going to do to those people. Now remember, I've been told by many a Christian that The New Testament is all about love and cuddliness and hugs. Let's see what Yeshua says about the servant in verse 46. Then his master will come on a day when the servant isn't expecting him. At a time he doesn't know in advance, his master will cut him in two and put him with the disloyal. Amen? Wow. Cut them in two. Yeshua, how are you going to win people to the kingdom by telling them you're going to cut them in two? I thought you were about love and cuddles and hugs and things and kisses. You said, you, how are you going to win people to the kingdom telling people you're going to cut them in two? Now, let's go to the Greek. Let's see what he really said. Oh, my goodness. I looked it up. I was like, wow, that was not cool. Yeshua must have been having a, he was, he was, he's, he, oh, goodness gracious, golly gee willikers. Let's see what the definition of the word cut is, okay? Um, I'm going to try to say the, the, I know Isabel, she's listening to, she's going to kill me. Uh, dick, uh, dick, oh, tomeo, dick o tomeo, dick o tomeo, okay? What, that's what, the Greek word means to cut into two parts, cut by scourging. Scourge severely. Yeshua is going to cut the you in two 
severely. He's going to scourge you into two parts. This is how angry Yeshua gets with those people for being disloyal to his father's kingdom. Now look at verse 47. Now look at verse 47. Now the servant who knew what his master wanted but didn't prepare or act according to his will will be whipped with many lashes. Amen? Our job is to amend our own hearts. You know what the master wants. It's written down. It's very plain. It's very simple. It's not very hard to follow if you have a heart of love. If you have a heart of lust, then you're good for a few minutes. You're good for a one-night stand. Love is about a marriage. Love is about commitment. Love is about being a servant. Love is about eternity. If you know what your master wants, and you don't do it, and you don't prepare, the Lord says he's going to whip you. The job of us today is to amend our hearts. The birth pangs have begun to start. Earthquakes are going on all over the globe. Why more so today than ever in recorded history? What is the Lord doing? What is he saying? Judgment starts with the house of God. And we're the house of God, and we're the ones that hold back the Lord's fury. But if you know what the master wants and you don't amend your heart and you still keep coming and you refuse to choose the right path, then you're a wolf in sheep's clothing because you're going to tear people down with you. Let's go to verse 48. However, the one who did what deserves a beating but didn't know will receive few lashes from him who has been given much, much will be demanded. From someone to whom people entrust much, they ask still more. Now this is a very interesting verse. You didn't know, but the Lord is saying you do. Because when Adam bit the fruit, he now knew all knowledge of good and evil. And that is inside of us. Now. The didn't know is the sadness of many of the leadership that call themselves rabbis, messianic rabbis, or pastors who teach on Sundays. Many of the messianic pastors write silly, they write, they write lots of books. You go to you know, some of the messianic websites and you're like, book after book after book after book. You know what book you need? You need three books. You need the Bible, a dictionary, and a concordance. Those are the three books you need. You don't need a silly little book called the Harbinger or whatever. Whatever other book there is out there. You really don't need them. What you need is a good grasp of God's language, especially in the Hebrew and then in the Brit Hadashah and the Greek for right now until the Detilin comes out. Because you're still going to be responsible because in your heart lives Torah. That's why the Lord could chastise Saddam and Amor. He went down to see them in Genesis 18. He stops off at Abraham's house. Abraham intercedes. But he went down because he heard there was an outcry against these two cities. He gave them the opportunity to do the right thing. And then they came banging on Lot's door, and the two angels said, okay, that's enough. That's enough. He destroyed the world in the flood, but how could he destroy the world in the flood? They knew. We're still the same people. We're the descendants of those people on the ark, Noah and his family. We're descendants of Adam and Chava. But I thought the Brit Hadashah was supposed to be the loving thing. It is loving. The Lord is still, this parable is not just for then, it's also for now. He's looking for us before chastise begins all over the globe, which it has begun with judgment in the house of God. Go back to Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7. 
Jeremiah 7, please. Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7. Did you like the new modern day parable? Yeah, the Lord just went, poured that one. That was around 1 o'clock. Jeremiah 7, verse 1 through 10. Hear my Yahoo 7, verse 1 through 10. If you really improve, blessings come. This is what this section is called. Yirmiyahu 7, verse 1 through 10. The word came to Yirmiyahu from Jehovah. Stand at the gate of the house of Jehovah and proclaim this word. Listen to the word of Jehovah, all you from Yehuda, who enter these gates to worship Jehovah. Here's what Jehovah Sivaot, the Elohim of Israel, says. Improve your ways and actions and I will let you stay in this place. Don't rely on deceitful slogans. The temple of Jehovah, the temple of Jehovah, these, are build, these buildings are the temple of Jehovah. No, but if you really improve your ways and actions, if you really administer justice between people, if you stop oppressing foreigners, orphans, and widows, if you stop shedding innocent blood in this place, and if you stop following other gods, to your own harm, then I will let you stay in this place, in the land I gave to your ancestors forever and ever. Look, you're relying on deceitful words that can't do you any good. First you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer to Baal, and go after other gods that you haven't known. Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, we are saved. Wow. So that you can go on doing these abominations. Amen? That is one powerful, powerful, powerful passage. I implore everybody to read the, the book of Jeremiah. I really, over the next week or two, read that book. It is so much what is going on in the world today. It really is. Let's take this passage apart because this is where we get our teaching for tonight. Okay? We did those other parts, but now we're going to really go into the, the, heart, the real meat and taters for the next 15 minutes. Meat and taters. Love meat and taters. But let's go back to verse 2. You ready? Stand at the gate of the house of Jehovah and proclaim this word. Listen to the word of Jehovah, all you from Yehuda who enter these gates to worship Jehovah. Amen? What day of the week do you think Yirmiyahu was saying this message that was brought forth? Okay, What day of the week do you think? Do you think it was third day, fourth day, fifth day, second day, first day, seventh day? Well, it was the seventh day. Okay, Tuesday is not really a good day to, for many people to be coming to the temple. Okay? Okay? The key to knowing it was Shabbat was the phrase, the phrase at the end of the sentence, who enter the gates to worship Jehovah. Okay? When is the day of worship? When is the, the day in the temple for worship? Okay? The other days were offering days and some other things, but the day of worship for the people, the day that's set aside for worship is the Shabbat. So imagine, <laughs> imagine, you know, you're Jeremiah, you're Yirmiyahu, and you, you tell everybody, okay, now look, let's go back to verse 2 and read it again. Stand at the gate of the house of Jehovah and proclaim the word. Listen to the word of Jehovah, all you from Yehovah, Yehuda, sorry, not Yehovah, Yehuda, who enter these gates to worship Jehovah, okay? So what does the word listen there? The word in Hebrew is Shema. He tells everybody, Shema! Now what does Shema mean? The word Shema means to hear, listen to, obey. And that's number one as a verb. Obey is a verb, so it's an action word. Number two, verbs are actions. Remember, verbs are actions. Okay, number two, to hear, to perceive by your ear, to hear concerning. That's number two. Number three, to hear with attention or interest, listen to, 
Number four, to understand the language that's being spoken to you. Number five, to be regarded, obeyed. That's what Shema means. And number six, to make a proclamation. So here, Shema. He's telling everybody, Shema, listen to what I'm going to say. Obey these words so that you can amend your hearts. That's what he's going to do. He's going to tell them what they're doing wrong on the Shabbat. He's telling people what they're doing wrong on the Shabbat as they're entering into to the temple to worship. Hmm, how well, you know, you're walking in. Repent! Uh, you know, I'm going to worship. Yeah, I'm going to repent. Okay, we're going to see what else goes on there because this is really good even with our modern day parable of the three houses that the guy that was sleeping for 2,000 years went to. Okay? Jehovah's telling Yahu and tell those coming to worship, it's very important to listen to the message. That all should listen concerning this opportunity that Jehovah's about to present to them. is going to present an opportunity because God is not happy. He is not happy. So he's going to present this opportunity to them. Now look at verse 3, please. Verse 3. Here's what Jehovah Sivot, the Elohim of Israel, says. Improve your ways or amend your ways and actions, and I will let you stay in this place. Amen? So Jeremiah's out there. Everybody knows who Yirmiyahu is. And he's saying, everybody walking, improve your ways. And the Lord said, I'll let you stay here. Well, you know, I am, you know, I am improving my ways. You know, so that's why I'm here for Shabbat. But a lot of people come because they're doing their time. They're doing their shift. Okay? Improve. How does one improve your ways? Well, you have to understand the commandments. You have to change a little part of your life each and every week that you come to Shabbat. You have to start walking closer with, with the Lord. Okay? Ways, the derrick. The Der- Yeshua said, I am the Derek, the Amphan, the Kai. The way there, the word ways is Derek. Okay? I have to improve the way I'm walking, the road I'm on, the, 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 the road that I'm traveling. Okay? I have to improve my actions. I have to improve my actions. How do I deal with everyday life when I'm not here at the temple? How do I deal with work each and every day? How do I deal with my spouse? How do I deal with my children? How do I deal with friends? How do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? You know, you got to improve your ways. Because the Lord knows your heart. And He's not liking it, He's saying. Okay, improve your actions. Amend your heart. Amendment. Change what you're doing. Okay, that's what He's saying. And then He gives a promise. He says, then I'm going to let you stay in this place. But if you don't, I'm going to let China come over and take the Philippines. If you don't, I'm going to let China come and take the western half of the United States. Here, please. Take the Californians. Bunch of fruits and nuts over there anyway. Okay? Lots of fruit and lots of nuts. And a lot of bad things. Okay? So here, you know, if you don't improve your ways, I give you dumb and dumber as presidential choices. Okay? But if you do amend your ways, then I'm going to let you stay in your place. I'm going to remove the thorns in your side. Because I see what my children are doing. I'm going to help them. I see their heart. They're trying. They're, they're doing their best. The Lord says, I'm going to help them out. Because He's a God of mercy. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. Now here's the big verse. This is the key to this. This is the key to telling your Christian friends. You might want to underline verse 10. Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name, and we are saved. So you can go on doing these abominations. Amen? So you come to the house, you know, you you come on Sunday worship. Yes, well, I'm saved, but I don't have to follow any laws, so I'm just going to continue in my abominations. Okay? I'm going to feed the poor, but, you know, we don't do the Torah because that's for the Jews. We don't do those holy days, that's for the Jews. Well, the 2,000-year-old Jewish man who saw the crucifixion went to your building and he would, you know, if Messiah came back after 2,000 years and he walked into your building, would he feel comfortable? But we're saved. Right. This is what Jeremiah is saying. Right. You're saved. You're coming to the building, but God is going to bring on a chastisement upon you. He's going to bring a chastisement on you because you don't want to amend your ways. 
yes, we're, we're saved, and I, I got to give up those things, and then I can go right back to them because I'm saved. God will just keep forgiving me for looking at pornography. God will forgive me for my fornication. God will forgive me. And I can just keep on going. You know, we can eat ham because God made it all clean now. We can eat, you know, shrimp. We can, you know, eat lobster. It's all clean now. Look at verse 10. Then you come and stand before me in this house that bears my, my name and say, We are saved. So that you can go on doing these abominations. Amen. Did you know the word saved was in the Old Testament? I thought that was a John 3 thing. Jeremiah was saying it long before Yochanan said it. Well, in the Gospel of Yochanan and John, when Yeshua said you, you got to be born again, we're saved. We're saved. But we can keep, continue not really keeping the Sabbath. I can be on my phone watching YouTube on Sabbath. Okay? I can be on Facebook on Sabbath. I can be looking at pictures on Sabbath. I, 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 doing whatever on Sabbath. But I'm saved. The Lord is saying, uh-uh. No, you're not. You have to learn how to amend your ways. Because judgment starts with the house of the Lord. And we know what happened to Israel. Seventy years. Because they didn't want to amend their ways. But we were saved. We had the temple. We had the offerings. God doesn't want the offerings if it's not done with a clean heart. With a heart that wants to. God doesn't want one. The offerings, if you've got blood on your hands and you're putting this stain of evil on it. Speaking of that, let's go to our last scripture. Turn to Yaakov, James chapter 4, please. James chapter 4. We're going to look at two verses. Yaakov. Yeshua's brother Yaakov. James. Chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. This part is called Submit and Amend Your Heart. Submit and Amend Your Heart. Yaakov chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Therefore, submit to God. Moreover, take a stand against the adversary, the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Clean your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. Amen? Submit your will to his will, like Yeshua said in the garden, at Gethsemane. Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will. We're to be like Yeshua, servants, lovers of the Father, lovers of the Word, doers of the Word, followers of the Word. Examples for those that are going to hell. Throwing them a life preserver. Take a stand for truth. Not just some of the time. A lot of people don't like to speak up about the issues that are going on in the world. It's the homos. Oh, I can't say anything. They might get mad. Like, I care? I want to save your soul. I don't care if you get mad at me for telling you the truth. Jeremiah spoke the truth. And because they didn't listen, it cost them 70 years. And when you're a slave, and when you're taken into captivity, they're not going to give you your human rights. You'll be lucky if you get food. If you're a woman, it's going to be horrendous. Rape has just become a norm for you. And we're not just talking one way. We're talking many ways. And we're not just talking one man. We're talking multiple. What they're going to do to your children is unspeakable because we see the reports coming out. Voice of the Martyrs has put out a report what's going on around the globe to the Christians. And why is it happening? Because judgment starts with the house of God. You can't stand for truth some of the times, people. You have to stand for truth all the time. Because if you're not standing for the truth all the time, then you're standing for lies because your silence means you stand for the evil. For if you don't stand all the time for the word and proclaim it, if you hear somebody saying something bad about our God and you don't stand up for the truth, 
then if the master were to come back at that time, what would he say to you? I'm going to cut you in two. Look at verse 8 again, please. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Clean your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. It's once again the Lord saying, amend. Clean your hands. How do you clean your hands? With soap and water? No. With the word of God. The mitzvot of God. What is a sinner? How do I know what sin is? 613 that lives in me. Come close to God. How do I get close to God? Amend my heart. Not my will be done, your will be done. Get rid of the sin is minimum. Try hard. Try hard. Then he will come close to you. If you try and you fail, the Father in heaven knows if you tried your hardest. There'll be bumps along the way, but that's okay, the Father says. He watches what you're doing, and he sees when you're trying and when you just don't give it down. Clean your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts. Stop being double-minded. Double-minded means doing it sometimes, not doing it sometimes. Double-minded, God says, you're a traitor. I'm going to cut you in two and put you with the disloyal. God is, you know, what Yaakov is quoting here is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 10. That's what he's quoting from. Psalm 51, to heal him 51. He wants a lev to whore. That's what it's talking about in Psalm 54. A lev to whore. A clean heart. A clean heart. Creating me a clean heart. A desire for your words. Let's go back to where we started and we'll end this particular teaching. Go back to Jeremiah 26, verse 13. I hope you've learned something in this lesson. Jeremiah 26, verse 13. Therefore now, improve your ways and your doings and listen to the voice of Jehovah, your Elohim. Then Jehovah will relent from the disaster he has decreed against you. Today, on this Shabbat, the Lord is looking for you to amend your hearts. Salvation is personal, personnel, and so is a walk with God. Each of us has a soul in our body. This is just a shell. The soul returns to God which gave it, the breath, the ruach. Today, improve your ways, amend your heart. Listen to the voice of Jehovah, for he never changes. Then he promises he'll relent on the disaster that's coming. Amen. And amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to the Remnants Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us and he's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life 
are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend a day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close the Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and biblical holy day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, Yeshua. Shalom.